All right, good afternoon. Well, I've got news for you. You're in the right place. It is, uh, what are we, are we Wednesday today? Wednesday, 3.30, we're in deep into the rick. It's been a long day, coffee's been served, cookies have been served. It is 70 degrees outside and you are not outside. You are definitely in the right place. Thank you for coming to today's session. We're gonna be talking about uh, AI, artificial intelligence and autonomy. And we have over 1,000 registrants for this session. Let me repeat that, we have 1,000 registrants for this session. I went to a rock concert last night that's why my voice is messed up. It's not COVID. You almost have to give that caveat these days. And there were less than 1,000 people at that concert. And I'm, I'm really blown away by the interest, but not surprised at all. I mean, as soon as you get on your news, whatever news feed you go for, AI is popping up nonstop. They're talking about AI on Jimmy Kimmel, on every TV show. So the fact that you're here today is, is heartwarming, and we're going to make you a part of today's session. So thank you so much to, to the 1,000 people that, that uh, signed up uh, to join us today. A couple of housekeeping items before we dig in. Um, by now, everyone should have the Wi-Fi. We're going to be playing with our phones today, so we'll ask you to use your phones for polls and Q's and A's. This is your tool for today, but please put it on silent uh, for today's session. That's going to be uh, my ask of you. Uh, and for awareness, all our sessions are recorded, and all the slides that you see today will be up on our website. Um, so for those folks who are joining us virtually, thank you. you make, you're making up part of that thousand. For the question and answer and for the polls, you should have a tab online that shows you where to click on polls and questions. And if you're in the room, if you haven't already scanned the QR code, and maybe we can flash the QR code if we get a sec, uh, the QR code is gonna be your key to the website where you'll have, thank you, thank you, for the, for the polling and the questions. So please make sure you sign in for this session, the QR code, and I see some folks with your phones out. You're winning, you're doing it, thank you. All right, and one quick tip, here's a hot tip. So we're talking about AI, right? You've heard about prompt engineering, hopefully. This is the new hot job. If you haven't, it's, it's the way to go. If you're a prompt engineer, you're gonna make some money in Silicon Valley. My tip for you on prompt engineering is, if you say the name of the person you want the question to go to, like Elbert, hyphen, my question is, what's your favorite color? That's an easy way to get the question to Elbert. Otherwise, you're relying on me to distribute the question and you don't wanna rely on me. So prompt engineering 101. All right, let's dig into it. Um, let's jump to slide three, okay. so. Um, my, my name, by the way, is Vic Hall. I work for the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Uh, I am also the responsible AI official, but more importantly today, I am your MC. I am your host, uh, and I want to tell you a quick story. So one of my very good friends, and I'm not going to name names right there, uh, told me about a fantastic podcast. And if you ever, if you know me at all, I, I, don't, I don't do podcasts, not my thing. But she said, check it out. And I spent three hours listening to this podcast. It was a fantastic podcast that broke down artificial intelligence. And it was a six month old podcast, it was already out of date, but it had some really good points in it. And my favorite part of it was the way it broke down kind of the, the world of AI and the way that people are viewing AI. And I see Commissioner Postolaki said, it's great to chat with you before the, the session to get your feeling on it. Because there's a groups of people who are not quite there on AI, there's groups of people who are really rolling in, embracing AI. And, and the podcast talked about this group of people who are, if you're on one side, you're like, oh my gosh, this is amazing what AI can accomplish, but, ugh, you can generate images and videos that could scare the heck out of people, and uh, it could be the, the, the Terminator coming. So there's a group of people think, hey, AI is gonna lead to the Terminator, and you've got the other group saying, man, AI is amazing. I, I could use AI to generate my Rick speech, or I can use AI to cure cancer, or solve world peace and hunger. So you have these two divided camps. So for the sake of our wonderful panelists today, I wanna gauge the temperature in the room of where this room is at. So. This is where you're going to play along, and I'm going to mandatory participation. You have to vote either AI is going to be the Terminator or AI is going to cure cancer. So, okay, here's what we're going to do. If you're with me on AI is rock and roll, we're going to solve the world. It's got to go rock and roll, rock and roll, okay? And if you're on, not on the bandwagon and AI is eesh, a little scary in Terminator, we're going to wave bye-bye to AI, okay? So with me in the room, mandatory participation, okay? On one, two, three, we're going to go... AI with me or AI bye bye, okay? Let me see some hands. Let's go, let's go, let's go. Okay, what do we got, what do we got? Okay, okay. <laughs> We're gathering data. Come on, keep it up, I need one more, one more. Come on folks, come on folks. All right, so I'm gonna say, what do you guys think? It was about 20% Terminators and 80%, so based upon, based upon that, you can gauge where the crowd's gonna be today, okay? All right, thanks, thanks for participating, I do appreciate that. I think the reality is, um, you know, AI is moving quickly, but we need to focus on where AI is today and where the near future is going to be. And when it comes to nuclear safety, I think the two most important things we can do is building our technical capabilities and collaborating, okay? Um, 
the nuclear industry and the NRC uh, are not known for adopting new technologies on, on the fly. We're not going to jump into something, and rightfully so, because of the consequences and possibilities. But when you're talking about safety, it's imperative that we start now to coordinate with other industries. And we have a fantastic panel today with diverse industries that we talk, we have these conversations now, so that we're ready what can come. And your role as participants, as the thousand so participants that are interested, is gonna be critically important today. So we're gonna rely on you to ask some difficult questions for some questioning attitude. Uh, and I wanna thank you for, for joining, for being here today on a very sunny, beautiful Wednesday day to be in this room to talk about AI and being part of the process. All right, so with that, I'm gonna do quick introductions on our speakers and then we're gonna do an actual poll and then we're gonna do a little more uh, bios as we go for each speaker. So, um, I mentioned our fantastic panel um, and I want to thank you guys all again for flying in from different parts of, of the country um, to, to join us here today and taking time out of your, your schedule. I really do appreciate it. Um, we have uh, a, a good mix. So we have uh, Dr. Darren Kofer, who is a principal fellow at Collins Aerospace, so representing the aerospace industry and what they're doing with automation. Um, we're going to have on the big screen um, is going to be uh, Chris Dixon joining us remotely from Canada. Chris is the Facility Operations Director at Global First Power. If you're walking these halls, you may have uh, heard of Ultra Safe Nuclear, so they're in the nuclear industry, and so Chris will talk to us a little bit. Hey, Chris, you're on. Good to see you. <laughs> Chris is going to talk to us about um, the work that he's doing um, with, with uh, small modular reactors. Uh, third, we'll have a look to the future, uh, Elbert, Elbert van der Bilge. How did I do? How did I do? Uh, close. Okay, okay, close, close, close. <laughs> it's a Dutch name, it's hard, okay. Um, and so Albert's going to be giving us a peek into the future. Albert has had some interesting experience with a chemical processing at the Nakagawa plant, and the press release I saw said that you guys had operated autonomously for 35 days, and I think that's old news now. You're much, you're much beyond that. So looking very much forward to hearing autonomous operation using AI that has worked. Uh, and finally, I do not play favorites. My favorite speaker of the day is Matt Dennis. So Matt uh, works with, uh, with me in the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Uh, Matt, um, I'm incredibly impressed by Matt because he can not only code in Python, but he can explain what he's doing in plain English and thankful for that, Matt. So uh, Matt will talk to us today about the AI strategic plan that the NRC has in place. Um, so with that, let's go to our first poll. And this is where I need you folks to pitch in and give us some information, give us some data uh, as we get rolling. And as we do that, I'll introduce, uh, Darren will be up next here. So let's, let's run the first poll, please, first is step one. All right. So the question for you folks here in the audience is, to what extent do you believe AI-enabled autonomy can positively impact safety and reliability in the nuclear industry? So please spend a couple minutes doing that. And as you are doing that, I'm going to introduce Dr. Kofer. So Dr. Kofer is a principal fellow at Collins Aerospace. He earned his PhD in electrical and computer engineering from the University of Texas in Austin. Uh, his area of expertise is in developing and applying advanced analysis methods and tools for verification and certification of high integrity systems. His background includes work with formal methods of, for systems and software analysis the design of real-time embedded systems for safety critical applications, and the development of nuclear propulsion systems in the U.S. Navy. Dr. Kofer has served as a principal investigator on government-sponsored research programs with NASA, NSA, the Air Force Research Laboratory, and DARPA, that's our Pentagon's uh, research folks who are responsible for giving us the iPhone, the internet, and all kinds of fun stuff. So pretty impressive uh, group of folks you worked with. Um, I know he's also uh, been a member of the SAE Committee on Artificial Intelligence for Aviation and Aerospace Control and Guidance Systems Committee, and you're also a senior member of IEEE. Um, so I'm gonna ask you, you can rock and roll, you can wave, but please do put your hands together and a round of applause for Dr. Kofer. Thank you. Thanks, Vic, and uh, thanks for inviting me here today. Uh, it's been a while since I've been at a RIC. I, uh, do get to dabble a bit in, um, uh, in this area because there's, we have a lot of uh, commonality between our industries. We're both uh, dealing with safety critical systems and um, uh, highly regulatory, regulated uh, industries. Uh, one difference is you guys can shut down your plant. We can't do that. We've got to keep flying. Um, and uh, also glad to be here. I'm a uh, Naval Reactors alumna alumni, so any other NR folks, uh, come say hi afterwards. Um, 
so why are we thinking about uh, and, and, and yeah why are we thinking about um, AI and machine learning in aviation uh, there's a number of driving factors uh, we've got increasing demand for new kinds of uh, aviation more commercial air travel more cargo supply chain activities um, service into urban dense uh, highly highly dense urban areas new kinds of vehicles uh, electric vehicles um, just a lot going on there uh, simultaneously, we're facing a shortage of trained uh, pilots, and that's going to go on for the for the foreseeable future. So, there are definitely proposals for having reduced numbers of crew in the in the cockpit, going to maybe single pilot operations, uh, maybe eventually full autonomy, and whatever we do there, that's going to require automation of tasks that are currently done by by human pilots, and many of those are are safety critical, and. So many of those, those tasks are going to be implemented using machine learning and AI technology. So, but just to be clear, um, there's, we're, we're not talking about the uh, Terminator um, uh, or sentient chat GPT kind, kind of uh, AI here. Uh, we're on the far other end of the spectrum. We're talking about neural networks, uh, supervised machine learning, um, much more uh, concrete, down-to-earth applications of AI ML technologies. But it's a starting point, uh, but we definitely want to start with the, the easier problems. Um, and what I want you to understand is this is happening now in our industry, in the aviation industry, and so we're, we're a little bit ahead of the curve where, where you all are. Um, so maybe there's some, going to be some good lessons learned, good uh, uh, regulations and standards and things put into place that might be helpful. Also, it turns out there's lots of uh, other use cases for AI and ML that really don't have anything to do with uh, autonomy. Uh, it just turns out that a neural network is a super efficient way to approximate a complex function, and we can save lots of um, computing resources, CPU time, and, and memory in a lot of our uh, uh, platforms. So why is this a problem at all? You've probably seen lots of uh, stuff in the, uh, in the news. It's easy to wham on uh, Tesla and the, whatever the, the crash of the day is. Tesla cars run into uh, emergency vehicles. All right, that seems bad. Um, uh, maybe this is another one that would have been harder to an, uh, anticipate um, in the drive through at the Whataburger in Texas. And of course, there's some dudes on horses in front of you and the car didn't know what to make of that because it wasn't trained on it, all right? So there's one of the, the key aspects uh, or concerns for machine learning systems is what is it going to do when it experiences, when it encounters inputs that it wasn't trained on? That's, you know, how do you detect, prevent unintended behaviors? That's the biggest safety concern that, um, that, that we have. Here's one where, with the, you know, phantom, phantom braking. Why? Because there was a stop sign on the billboard there and it said, oh, there's a stop sign, I'm going to stop. Um, here's another one that's harder to explain. It's signaling a left turn into the wall of the tunnel and then stopping and then causes a huge pileup. So, um, it, it, so this, don't be this, right? So in aviation, we don't want to be this. We don't want to be in the news. Um, we don't want to cause crashes. That's just, we don't, just, just like you guys, we don't beta test on our customers, all right? So it's gonna, it's gonna go down a lot uh, more different in, uh, in, in our world. Um, okay, so from a regulatory standpoint, uh, everything traces back to Title 14, Part 25 for um, transport category airplanes, what um, y'all would have, uh, you know, if you fly anywhere, that's probably what you fly on. The key elements uh, are highlighted here. We have to show that the airplane and all of its systems performs their intended function under any foreseeable operating conditions and any uh, failure condition that could you know, terminate the flight or end safe flight has to be extremely probable, uh, improbable. And we have uh, a whole bunch of uh, uh, standards, industry standards, that serve as a means of compliance that regulators use when evaluating whether you know, we as an applicant come to them and say, hey, I've got a new airplane, I've got a new system, I want you to approve it. Um, and I followed these industry standards and everybody sort of agrees that that's, that's a, you can use that as a way of complying with the, the regulations. And these cover everything from safety analysis to system design to um, hardware and software design. Um, and, I, and I'm really thinking about you know, the, the computational parts of the, of the airplane. Um, but this is, these are all aimed at showing that the aircraft of the system satisfies its requirements 
and has no unintended behavior, no surprises. Um, so thinking back to the pictures of, uh, of the Tesla accidents and stuff, um, there are those, those that kind of helps you see that well, there's some technical problems, um, but there's also uh, certification problems for us. These these uh, these cert standards um, make certain assumptions about the kind of system that you're building, the nature of the software, and uh, it turns out uh, that machine learning, uh, data-driven um, functions learned from data, break a lot of the assumptions that we have, and so there's a uh, SAE publication that came out a couple years ago where our uh, committee that's working on, on new standards in this area uh, identified what the concerns are from a regulatory uh, standpoint and from a, uh, a certification process standpoint. Uh, so that's you know a, a lot of the, the, the kinds of testing that we do, the structural coverage analysis, traceability, um, those cause problems. Here's a, a XKCD cartoon that you may have seen if you uh, uh, look at such things that actually is a really good summary of what these, uh, what some of these challenges are, right? This is your machine learning system. Yep, pour the data into this big pile of linear algebra and collect the answers on the other side. What if they're wrong? Stir the pile until they start looking right. Okay, haha, -ha. but this is uh, too, too close to the truth as it turns out. Um, what if the answers are wrong? That's the verification question. It's actually hard to tell. A lot of our verification processes don't work. What does that mean for them to start looking right? It's actually challenging to come up with requirements for a lot of these systems that we can uh, independently verify. Um, and then the, the big pile of linear algebra speaks to the, some uh, implementation concerns related to languages. So here's, here's kind of a summary of what, you know, what those are. But as I mentioned before, structural, uh, the, uh, the structural coverage metrics that don't work in this world those are one of our key tools for detecting and eliminating unintended behavior, eliminating those surprises. So we have to do, we have to bring other technologies to bear uh, in order to, to deal with that. Um, so the authorities in our world are engaging with this problem in different ways. Um, the FAA equivalent in Europe is uh, EASA. They are anticipating lots of applicants in this area, and so they've been trying to get out in front of it and push for standardization to put up some, some guardrails. There's a lot of really good reports that you can search for. They, th these are really high quality, a lot of good information on what objectives you should use to evaluate these kinds of systems and what possible means of compliance might be. The FAA is taking a little different approach or taking more of a bottom-up approach. They want applicants to bring them actual candidate systems, use this issue paper process to evaluate them on a one-by-one -one basis and come up with individual means of compliance. Learn from that and then figure out what, what their process and what the standardization should be. Hopefully we'll meet in the middle um, somewhere. Uh, and in that middle ground is this uh, SAE industry uh, committee, uh, G34, that's developing a new standard that will fill this gap for where our current cert processes uh, don't work. So that's something else to, to keep an eye on. We have you know, actual applications, actual regulations, actual industry standards that are under development right now that might be super, uh, super useful. And I'll just say that Collins um, just completed one of these uh, issue paper approvals for a very, very simple um, neural network based machine learning system and uh, got FAA approval for, for one of these uh, issue papers. And as far as I know, we're the first ones to do it. But we picked something super simple so we could just focus on what are the AIML unique aspects uh, of this function and work out what the, the, the approval process uh, should be. So we'll, we'll, we'll build, on, build on that. Um, I mentioned new technologies that might uh, be required. One is, uh, uh, what's called formal methods that is really just using mathematical logic-based analysis tools to analyze these systems. There's a, the, we, we have these kinds of tools that allow us to analyze and make proofs of correctness about traditional software system. There's a new category of tools that allow us to uh, analyze neural network models and uh, uh, basically propagate inputs through the system and comprehensively analyze um, all of their behavior over the entire input space in order to avoid these unintended behaviors or unexpected behaviors. What that means is even though the system was trained on some, you know, <clears throat> hundreds of thousands or millions of data points, there's lots, you know, an infinite number of points that we didn't train it on. This, this kind of a tool allows us to 
say that, well, even on those un untested points, we can bound what the output is. Uh, there's, there's scalability limits for the size of systems that we can approach there, but it's a really good method. Another um, methodology that we're developing is runtime assurance architectures. This is essentially building trustworthy monitors and backup functions that you embed or wrap around the um, less trusted uh, uh, machine learning system in order to detect when it is leaving its um, uh, safe region of operation and intervene with some uh, safe backup action. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and we've, act, we've, we've done some uh, nice flight testing with this in an application where the neural network was generating um, um, collision avoidance trajectories uh, for two aircraft that were you know, flying at, at each other. And then our system would uh, detect whether or not the, the, the neural network was actually um, uh, providing a safe, uh, a safe trajectory and, uh, and uh, intervene. So there's a, there's a cool video of that on this website. Okay, the last thing I wanna leave you with here is this, uh, this picture that uh, emphasizes the fact that there's no one size fits all. And the way I like to break this down is this axis of criticality on the x-axis and complexity on the y-axis. So if we're just looking at low criticality systems, um, where the impact, uh, you know, these are, these are not safety critical system, the impact is small, we can treat uh, a machine learning system as a black box, use a lot of our existing tools, um, verify it uh, through, through testing. Um, but if we want to do something more critical, uh, the higher criticality applications, for ones that are of limited complexity, we can apply these new formal methods tools to allow us to possibly use smaller systems in uh, high criticality applications. And when I say small, I'm talking of things that have thousands, tens of thousands of um, neurons or parameters uh, in them. Uh, those things, there's a lot of research right now scaling up those tools to hundreds of thousands and millions of neurons. However, we're still not going to get to vision-based perception kinds of systems, which is where um, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of interest. So that's, that's where new research is, uh, is really important. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, where does that leave us? Um, AI and ML are going to be used to meet demands for increasingly autonomous aircraft. There's a lot of technical challenges and certification barriers uh, in the aviation world de dealing with, you know, the unknown unknowns. Um, new cert guidance is being developed. New assurance technologies are being developed. But there's never going to be any one-size-fits-all. But we can make progress um, by focusing on, you know, these, these very specific uh, applications. There's a couple of uh, interesting papers if you're um, uh, interested in, in reading more. Thanks. Thanks again, Darren. Appreciate that. All right, folks. We're going to go to our second poll and gather some more data. <coughs> Bring up the second poll, please. All right. So the question for poll number two, what do you consider the biggest potential risk associated with AI-enabled autonomy in nuclear operations? All right, so please take a minute to, take, to fill out the poll. While you're doing that, I will introduce our second speaker who will be joining us virtually in a minute. So Chris Dixon, who is our Facility Operations Director, uh, he is the Facility Operations Director at Global First Power. Um, again, Global First Power, uh, if you don't know them, is a joint venture between Ultra Safe Nuclear Company and Ontario Power Generation, OPG. Uh, Global First is currently working to construct and operate a small modular reactor called the Micro Modular Reactor. Uh, they're doing it at the Chalk River Laboratories in Ontario. It's a site owned by the AECL, the Atomic Energy of Canada Limited, uh, and managed by the Canadian Nuclear Laboratories, CNL. The project uh, they're looking to have serve as a model for future nuclear energy projects in remote communities and heavy industry. So it's good we have uh, kind of a forward looking uh, nuclear industry rep uh, joining us here today. So, and Chris brings over 29 years of nuclear operations leadership experience as a licensed shift manager at the Pickering Nuclear Generating Station and assistant operations manager for the Pickering and Darlington Nuclear Generating Stations. Chris is a diverse and inclusive teamwork focused leader. He's dedicated to the integration of new technological innovations that will enable small modular reactors to be an inherently safe, carbon free and cost effective community uh, for electrical generation technology supporting positive climate change action. 
Um, so with that, Chris, um, I hope you can uh, hear the applause in the room because we're going to give you a right, nice, warm round of applause and wish you were here, here uh, joining us in Rockville because this is, again, 70 degrees. I know you're up north in Canada where it's probably a little chillier. So on that note, everyone, please uh, put your hands together and welcome Chris. Hi, everybody. I can't uh, hear everybody applause. Can everybody hear me? Loud and clear, yeah, okay. it's great. Yeah, right. um, uh, and again, I, I really wish I could have actually come down, but uh, here in Canada, it is actually officially gone above the freezing mark. It is also 70 degrees Celsius here. Uh, so we're now exiting our hibernation phase, and essentially it's a federally mandated patio season now for here until October, so I need to participate in that as well. Um, so again, thank you for having me here. Uh, I am Chris Dixon, Facility Operations uh, Manager for Global First Power. You could uh, go to the next slide, please. Uh, as said before, we are uh, an amalgam of the joint venture of UltraSafe Nuclear Corporation, provide the design knowledge and Ontario Power Generation, my uh, essentially home office, um, where we essentially provide project management and, in my case, operational experience. And, and we have a kind of a unique um, business model. We, especially here in Canada and also looking at island states, we're looking to essentially provide a safe inherently safe, clean energy, nuclear energy uh, for off-grid capabilities, which provides us a really kind of unique uh, challenge, and that's why we really dug deep into uh, sort of looking at autonomous operation and AI. Move to the next slide, please. Um, so where we are in the nuclear power industry right now is, is uh, unfortunately, we are kind of lagging behind a lot of the industry when it really comes about how we're looking at automation and just sort of data management sets that are coming. So, so we exist in the operational technology or the OT world. We, we pull data in, uh, and up until relatively recently, we haven't done a lot of that. Uh, data and performance is being pulled in into you know, monitoring and diagnostic centers, but that information is generally just uh, manually kind of reviewed through engineers or analysis to kind of understand potential trends or, or problems within components or systems. Um, but again, it's very heavy, very labor intensive. Uh, there have been more recently in the last couple of years, a little bit more of a kind of scratching at the surface of, of utilization of digital twins. Uh, but even that's very much in its infancy. There are a few projects here and there in engineering space uh, and design space. Uh, there are obviously industries which are much further ahead than us, uh, say the oil and gas industry for utilization of digital twins. But at this point, we're just starting to dig into that. And but the final part to that is really the actions, the recommendations that we get from our digital twins or, or from our AI or from our machine learning, which is essentially what can we use, what knowledge can we gain from the machine to understand what kind of predictive analytics or even operational decision making um, that the machine can assist us with uh, to essentially remove a lot of the burden in terms of the decision making by an individual operator. And unfortunately, right now, this is essentially future tech. Move to the next slide, please. Um, so I'm sure everyone has seen this. This is essentially the five levels of automation um, that's uh, done at your Reg 700. Uh, really what I want this as is just kind of a baseline of discussion of, although it feels very future tech, there are elements, especially where I grew up, which was essentially the can-do industry, there, there are levels of automation um, that approach what we would consider almost autonomous operation. And there's a big distinction between automation and autonomous. And for the purposes of the operational decision-making kind of guidance that I'd like to propose here, I'd like to kind of look at item number five, and that's autonomous operation, or in can-do space, it's essentially our reactor control system. Um, so next slide, please. So if anybody's had the opportunity to be able to run a can-do. They are relatively complex machines. Uh, there's a, you know hundreds of points of, of data which comes in into the reactor regulating system. There are multiple algorithms that actually control reactor power, control you know reactivity control devices, liquid zone, um, and of course it's bound within its own failure mechanism. Once you know a number of parameters go beyond a kind of you know what would be considered as a, not a design limit but just sort of a safety margin, that, you know it fails safe, shuts down the reactor as expected. Uh, however, there are also elements of, you know, essentially input failure, which could cause like a voltage strip, for example, that then wouldn't actually reach the tolerance for actually shutting down the reactor, but may actually cause what we'd call an unrequested power change. Now, as an operator, um, I can't possibly understand the hundreds of inputs and diagnose each one specifically. So, but what I'm trained in is to understand, you know, how does the algorithms work? What are the main control functions? What are the sort of the, the, the major failure modes? And ultimately, what is the response on me and on the reactor to be able to do that? Um, so knowing that, as I said, there's a, a hundreds of points of data which come in in a very quick succession, 
Uh, essentially, my operational decision making is, is procedurally uh, enabled. And so it's basically, it falls into some, some standard sets, which is obviously the alarm and parameter monitoring. It, it's safe stating the reactor, being able to reduce reactor power to give you margin to safety, uh, to then to move into a diagnosis and understanding. And that diagnosis is time limited, of course, on, on our requested power chains. It's either understand the failure mode, uh, safe state that particular parameter uh, and to be able to determine where the operability is that or you know if that uh, knowledge isn't immediately recognizable to safe state the reactor put it into a shutdown and guaranteed uh, safe state overarching priority of course is the safe state of the reactor um, rather than the diagnosis of the reactor or the failure mechanism itself the next slide please so as we start to move into uh, AI technology or machine learning is that the, the AI in itself and automated systems will ultimately start to perform a lot of the safe stating and diagnosis response that normally I would be doing as a licensed operator. Um, and, and that will put me into a very different kind of position or my operators and that will be, we're ultimately be the verifiers of actions by the machine rather than the initiators of the action itself. Uh, and as such, then, the AI control systems must be designed essentially with an AI risk management framework to allow for the responsible development of AI, and more importantly, to increase the, the trustworthiness of AI systems. So for I as an operator to, to be able to use and trust an AI system, it, it needs to be designed essentially with the four NIST principles here for AI development. Uh, and so start off obviously with the AI risk management framework. It clearly has to be safe. It has to prioritize safe response. Uh, it has to be secure. Cybersecurity is, is with a doubt the, uh, the, the most important aspect of this, but it also has to be able to be able to be resilient in terms of like brief power interruptions or communications interruptions. And most importantly, it has to be understandable to the operator. If you go back to the concept of how I would respond to a kind of a very complex system. Ultimately, I need to understand why a machine has done what it's done for me to verify that's the correct action and to, uh, to ensure that, that uh, it, the machine continues to run or is safe stated. And so the understanding of that really then goes into the system design principles for AI. And that is essentially the explanation. It has to be, first and fundamentally, it has to be human-centered. It has to be understandable to the operator itself. So it's it's not just why an action has happened, but the rationale of why. What inputs drove the machine to take the automated action that it is, that, that happened. And of course, it has to be accurate in terms of the explanations. Uh, and the final part is, like any uh, AI, is that there have to be fundamental limits in terms of, of what its operability is. Uh, and that is, is that once it goes beyond a certain parameter, it will automatically safe state without operator intervention. Next slide, please. Um, so automation doesn't happen over day. Rome knows it was not built in a day either. And, and this is going to be a long drawn out evolution that is going to require the collaboration of everybody in industry. So if you take a look at the automation evolution uh, here right now, we essentially really are on the far left. We are under the reporting. Data comes in from instrumentation control in the field. Currently, we are starting to analyze it, um, but that's done on a very manual basis. The first step that we're going to be looking for is essentially the predictive analytics. The idea is that the machine can diagnose through algorithms or through the AI itself to, to predict when components may fail to do kind of a predictive analysis of, of when a component will fail so that you can replace it in advance and, and obviously uh, reduce FLR. Um, ultimately, the changeover from the OT to the IOT world is how you start to integrate that asset management into essentially your, um, your IT systems, your architecture, your enterprise resource uh, processes, or your enterprise asset management, essentially your APM that the machine then feeds into essentially your business management systems to automatically schedule maintenance to be able to essentially establish maintenance in advance of failure. Uh, and, and then as we, we ensure that they, you know, the, the safety of the, uh, the systems, as we, we give it the more OPEX to be able to generate and as we become more comfortable with it, then and then and only then will we start to really kind of move into uh, essentially more of a recommended actions for the operator 
you know, that a, a, uh, a not just a failure may happen, but, uh, you know, I have swapped over a feed train because of these parameters. Uh, the operator initially will confirm and allow that action to happen, but then ultimately what we were looking for is essentially, essentially the autonomous uh, or the autonomy of that machine that the machine may make the, the, the action as long as it is inherently safe. The operator can verify that, that the action is correct and that the response is correct uh, and, and essentially become a monitor of that. Next slide, please. Um, so initially, this is the first phase here, which is essentially how you actually do the predictive analytics in your asset management. So there's nothing to do with control of the system yet, but ultimately this is how you're just gonna be able to protect the asset on an economical aspect. Um, as I said, ultimately, it will feed an automatic into the uh, the APM will feed into EAF and ERP and, and schedule maintenance in advance. The next slide, please. Uh, and finally, obviously, is that the demonstration phases, it doesn't happen just with the first reactor, but it will have to happen with multiple iterations of, you know, future phases of reactors. Uh, we start wide, we, we move in closer, but essentially once you uh, can prove the inherent safety or the inherent security of the, uh, the reactor design, as you start to pour, pull more information off the machine, then you can start to automate of it, uh, starting off with a relatively simple non-safety uh, related ones, and then ultimately potentially moving into um, safety related system. That clearly will only happen after a lot of time, a lot of experience, uh, and with fixed algorithms rather than just a, an open uh, machine learning format. That's all I have. Questions and answers I will take after the presentations. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. Appreciate the presentation. Anybody who has systems drawings on his board in the background means serious business as a guarantee. Um, all right, we're going to go to our third polling question, and then we're going to glimpse into the future with Albert's presentation. So if I could ask uh, our folks to bring up poll question number three, please. And again, this is where I'm asking our wonderful audience to participate both online and here in person. Okay, let's go for question number three. We're going to go for the third one, please. Okay, oh, that looks like number two still. There we go, there we go. So question number three, and again, we're gonna glimpse into the future with Albert's presentation. So this is a good, good again, temperature measurement of the crowd. How soon do you think commercial nuclear will be using AI applications in an NRC regulated activity? So looking forward to your responses there. As you think about that, we'll welcome Albert von der Beil. I think I got that right, am I doing all right? Okay, yeah. von der Beil, it's a tough name. Um, to the stage, uh, Albert is the Director of Marketing and Solutions Consulting at Yokogawa. Uh, it's the Yokogawa Corporation for America. Uh, he joined Yokogawa in 2008 and has held various roles in marketing and sales throughout his tenure, but don't be fooled, extremely technical and on game. Um, he holds a master's degree in chemical engineering from Delft University of Technology and has been working in the industrial automation industry for 25 years. In addition to his passion for co-innovating uh, with end users in the process industry, Albert has had the pleasure of working closely with the headquarters organization in Japan, as well as several research and development centers within Yokogawa globally on new technology developments, including artificial intelligence, and supervisory control and data acquisitions. And again, he's gonna be giving us a glimpse into what is possible, at least in the chemical industry. So please, again, you can rock out, you can wave, but please put your hands together for, uh, for Albert. Thank you very much and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here up the stage and to share some of uh, the experiences Yokogawa was able to generate uh, uh, back in Japan. And uh, I'm happy to share with you some of, of the approach we took and what the results were with the specific uh, chemical customer. So I, I will be talking about the use case in the chemical industry, and hopefully that will appeal to you in, in the nuclear industry as well. Uh, we are familiar with the nuclear industry. We, we sell some recorders. We sell actually some safety systems um, up to sale classification level four, which is a solid state technology. And that's a little bit far away from artificial intelligence, I guess. Um, but uh, nonetheless, I think this is an interesting use case. So let's, let's see what we can uh, uh, get out of this. And, and I'll start off with a, a, 
uh, a picture of where we see the future going in the, in the process industries in general. And I think a lot of this has been reflected already in earlier presentations today, also in the previous session, when they talked about humans factors engineering. Um, and, and we were challenged to think about the, the most uh, interesting things that will influence our future. And this picture is reflecting some of that. So if you look at the state of the industry, most of our customers are currently running either in semi-autonomous or autonom uh, automated state. Uh, and that means there is a lot of drive in the industry actually to go to a higher level of autonomy. Uh, for the last 15 years, we heard a, a lot about the retirement wave. But what we're actually facing as an industry now is that after COVID, we're actually suffering from it. And we really start lacking the skill sets that are required to continuously operate uh, our, our facilities. And, and that's really what we see now as an uptake in the industry to go to that higher level of autonomy. So that's really depicted on the top side of the picture. Um, then looking back at, at my history with 25 years of history in automation, when I joined the industrial automation segment, we had proprietary systems. Nothing was connected, uh, air-gapped. Was technology people were actually referencing to, no, our, our systems, our operational systems are not connected to anything. But then the industry wanted us to move to common off-the-shelf technology. We embraced Microsoft uh, software and, and we started making systems more open. Um, so that's all great, and that's really the basis for IT-OT integration. And that's what you see in the bottom of this slide, is really the, the drive in the industry to, to get more connected. And, and what you see now happening is that it's not even limited to, to companies uh, itself, but it's actually going into the supply chain and even into society. And I always like to give the example of the refinery in Rotterdam from Shell that is having excess carbon dioxide and excess heat and they're actually putting that into the greenhouses and the district heating. And that's great, that's great. That's a, a good example of sustainability towards the future. But you need to do a lot with data integration and security to make that happen. So I, I think the previous session actually touched upon this increasing or ever increasing complexity that we see. And that's also what we see. Huh? And, and we hope as a company to be ready to help our customers going forward. But I think this is the journey we're all on. Uh, our world is becoming more and more complex and we're all struggling to get the right resources in place who are able to, to, to deal with that complexity. So let's dive a little bit in and, and talk about AI and, and, and what is required in general to get to that higher level of autonomy. Um, so, so AI is, is, is essential to get to that higher level of autonomy. Um, so it's really talking about getting people out of harm's way it's, it's making the industry safer, a safer place to live near to uh, and, and to prevent incidents from happening. And, and please do not send humans to inspect a gas leak and those type of things, but send a robot who is, by the way, already using artificial intelligence. And I think I saw 20% of the respondents actually stating that they're already implementing AI. Um, so I'm really curious and would invite those 20% to also speak up and share those use cases because I think it's those type of use cases that, that enable us to foster adoption. Um, a lot of the things here were uh, already emphasized by Chris and are related to asset management, predictive maintenance. And it's not new, we're already doing that as an industry. Uh, we have soft sensors for the last 15 years already in place. AI is just enabling us to do it even better. And, and yesterday I was present at the AFPM, uh, the North American Association of uh, Refiners and Petrochemical Companies. And they were also talking about some of the successes they had to, to deploy AI and speed up the early detection, for example, for heat exchangers. And that allows them now 44 days in advance to already detect an upcoming issue and to address that issue before the heat exchanger would actually trip uh, the facility, for example. Um, so I think it's, it's taking models, technology that we already have and augment them with artificial intelligence to make them even faster, more efficient and more capable of, of getting better results. Uh, the thing I will be talking about in, in this pitch is mainly the advanced operation side of things. So this is where it becomes a little bit scary because are we really going to deploy AI on reactor control and nuclear or on chemical processes? And I think there are ways to do that safely, even with artificial intelligence. 
So before I go in the actual use case, I just want to talk uh, about this one. And, and maybe by raise of hands, who is familiar with this basic control dilemma that is given to students? See some people there. So this is the three tank challenge that you get, right? And it's, it's just hard to control that. So that's why it's always given as students to, to start working on control and how you can uh, get to a stable situation where um, you're not oscilla oscillating, uh, for example, in the outputs. And I have a small video on how we are deploying what we call FKDPP, Factorial Kernel Dynamic Policy Programming, which is actually the, the uh, machine learning reinforcement learning algorithm that we developed with the Nara Institute in, in Japan. Um, and that is used also on this simple use case before I talk more about the industrial use case. Um, so I'm going to show the movie and I will narrate uh, through it. Um, so this is showing um, the three tanks, obviously, and then it's also showing how we actually go through that process of learning. So the FKDPP allows you to get to an optimized AI control model within 30 iterations. So this is just the first trial and you see there's not really a stable situation. And the, the, the process is not getting to a stable state, it's just overfloating one of the reactors. But then after 20 iterations, it actually becomes more interesting. So you see that the AI control model is actually slower getting into filling up that, that tank we're looking at, and then you see it reaches a state of oscillation, which is not preferred because you're overshooting and undershooting. Um, so after 25 iterations of learning, you will see that the AI control model is actually getting a little bit more intelligent, and even though there is still a little bit of oscillating, oscillation, you see that the model is actually able to already start controlling the process very fast and, and efficiently. And then the 30th iteration, this is just where it starts to be a little bit amazing and stable. So this is where we actually notice that, that with the AI control model that was developed on, an, on a simulator model and then trained on a simulator and then actually deployed on the actual uh, unit was able to do it 50 to 70% quicker, faster and more efficiently than any of the other control algorithms we had in place. So I think this movie is just an illustration of what is possible with AI, and, and it's just hopeful also for you guys to take a look at what the possibilities are to deploy such a thing in, in, in a safe way. Um, so let me talk a little bit about the actual uh, chemical use case that, that we were uh, dealing with in Japan. Um, the customer was Ineos, um, a chemical a uh, customer who had a distillation process where the operator needed to make a manual intervention every 15 minutes. Um, so this is challenging, right? You don't want to have manual operation 24-7 every 15 minutes. It doesn't make sense. Um, so the customer actually selected this distillation process to uh, try out the AI uh, control model. So first of all, we started developing uh, the simulator model, because there was no simulator for this unit, so we had to go through months of creating the simulation model. And then we were able to use reinforcement learning, so we, we penalize bad behavior and outcomes, and we reward good behaviors and outcomes, and that's actually how you train the model. Um, um, what is interesting is that we're not controlling the set point value. So the AI control model is actually directly controlling the outputs. So that is also why it's capable of doing things more faster than traditional advanced process control or PID control that, that we're looking at. So in the AI control model, we actually gave two objectives. One was the quality of the distillation process to make sure that enough segregation is taking place in the distillation product process. But the other one was really the energy optimization. And so as you could see in the previous slides, we were actually controlling the two waste heat process streams on both sides to make sure that you can manipula manipulate the actual uh, energy efficiency in the process. So this is really what we actually did, and it is a butadiene. Do I say that correctly? I'm always struggling with that. I am a chemical engineer, though, but <laughs> forgive me. Um, and, and I think what was the outcome of this this uh, learning process is that we were able to actually do autonomous control. And first of all, it was only 35 days. 
And people ask me all the time, why only 35 days? Well, they had a scheduled maintenance stop. Okay, so that's interesting. So the next question is, how long have you been running now autonomously? The answer is 22 months without any manual intervention. So this is a clear example of what can be achieved with an AI control model in a safe way. And I think that's the main thing as a nuclear audience, what you are interested in, is how can you deploy something which is maybe not immediately a generative AI model that can cause a runaway in a facility, but actually have an AI control model uh, developed offline and then being deployed online. Uh, it also means that if something major changes in the process, you have to retrain the model. However, small changes or even upsets you can train in a simulated environment. Guess what? Most simulators today, you can speed, uh, speed up a factor 60. So the whole training of the actual AI control model is, is not years, um, as with traditional APC, where you have to go through step change uh, procedures in your process. <coughs> but it's actually a matter of, of weeks to months to come up with these type of AI, AI, AI control models. Um, so I think the case is, is made by this, this one that it can be implemented in a safe way. Obviously, there are a lot of things you need to take care of. When you go through this implementation, we had a, a lead time of one and a half year. And the last phase was really how to integrate the AI control model in the existing controls uh, and how to integrate that in the safety interlocks that are actually in the plant. So I think that that is without question when you start implementing AI control models uh, or AI technology in general, um, it's not just deploying some new technology in your facility. It comes with all the, the change management steps that you need to take to train the people, make sure the operators understand what you're doing. And the operators were part of this process because in the end they need to rely on this. Um, so in summary, um, I think the NEOS case is a clear example of, of the adoption of AI in, in the industry, in the process industries. I think it is proven that you can deploy it in a safe way in process industries. And, and I would really advise everybody to take a look at, at what is possible with, with AI, even for control uh, or advanced reactor control on the nuclear side. And I'm really uh, looking forward to any discussion we can have uh, maybe during the panel on some of the other use cases that you consider or are thinking of in the nuclear industry and how that resembles what, what I've just presented. Awesome. Thanks so much. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Albert. All right. We're going to run to our fourth and final polling question before we introduce Matt. So if I could ask the, uh, the kind folks at AV to bring up our fourth and final polling question, please. And again, a reminder, the phone is the best way to ask questions. We have a few questions coming in. Thanks. And let's keep those coming because we're going to have uh, plenty of time for questions after this. All right. So our fourth and final question, what process would be most effective in promoting responsible development and deployment of AI-enabled autonomy in the nuclear industry? So folks, have a think on that and please respond. As we're doing that, we're going to welcome our anchor to the stage, Matt Dennis. Matt Dennis is a data scientist here at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission in the Office of Nuclear Regulatory Research, my favorite office of all the agency. Um, he leads the agency's effort in developing and implementing the NRC Artificial Intelligence Strategic Plan, which is no small feat. Additionally, Matt supports the development and maintenance of the MAX Consequence Analysis suite of codes and conducts severe accidents, accident consequence analyses. Uh, prior to joining the NRC, Matt held positions at Northrop Grumman and Sandia National Laboratories. He also um, has a BS and an MS in nuclear engineering from Missouri University of Science and Technology in Rolla, right? Got it. All right, so please put your hands together or a big rock and roll welcome to Matt Dennis. Thank you so much. Thank you, Vic. And uh, since I'm the last speaker and I want to give us plenty of time for questions uh, and panel discussion, I will keep my uh, presentation hopefully brief. And I will say that last question, I was actually disappointed to see that the, run, the front vote wasn't for uh, federal regulation. That was the lowest <laughs> one there. So 
So I, I'm guessing people don't want me to overregulate uh, the use of AI in the nuclear industry. So uh, disappointing, but I'll, I'll survive. So um, my presentation today, I'm going to talk about uh, where, what we're doing at the NRC. Uh, if you've heard my remarks at some of our previous public workshops, this, a lot of this shouldn't come as a surprise to you. But uh, I will disappoint you all in that I don't have any AI-generated photos of the royal family. I don't have any panda pictures or Tesla crashes. My other slide decks do, and I do talk about uh, ensuring safe uh, adoption of AI and ML with respect to some Tesla crashes, but not today. So uh, today I'm going to talk a little bit about where we're at and where we're going, uh, give you a little bit of a story arc of the NRC's uh, progress in artificial intelligence and machine learning. So we recognized uh, three to four years ago that the industry wants to use AI. And that shouldn't come as a surprise, although three years ago we didn't have ChatGPT, so our environment was quite different from what it is today. Even a year ago, as I reflect back on the AI session we had last year, things have changed quite a lot. Um, so that is part of why the AI strategic plan was developed, was to be flexible and look forward to the next few years so that we can prepare the staff for this ever-changing technology should the day come when there is something that the NRC needs to evaluate with respect to an AI usage in an NRC-regulated activity. So the second box uh, in the middle, you'll notice some discussion about what the federal agencies, the US federal government at large is doing, and there is a slew of stuff that has come out uh, from the current administration. There's executive orders, there's Office of Management and Budget guidance. So not only us as the NRC are thinking about how we would review, evaluate AI technology, that same thing is being applied to us. So there are some guidance documents, the, risk, the NIST AI risk management framework. So the federal government at large is considering this issue too. And I'll, I'll make a comment about the some of the stuff we've seen across the federal agencies in a little bit. But we have been involved in a number of activities. We're involved in IAEA working groups. Uh, we're involved in some trilateral engagements with the uh, Canadian nuclear regulator and the UK nuclear regulator. Not to mention that at any one time you can find an AI conference that's coming up. Uh, and so there's a lot of good material out there for us to learn from. And then finally on this slide, internally we are also, like I said, grappling with this issue as well. As our industry wants to use AI for beneficial things, so do we. Um, so the uh, chair recently put out a tasking memo and the group that's been working on that project has gotten a slew of ideas recently and they're working through those. So I guess uh, my point is there's no shortage of topics where AI could be used. Uh, both internally and externally. And I'll mention the interest is not just in our area. Uh, a couple of my colleagues and I went to a DOD conference. Uh, so the Department of Defense is, they're also grappling with this. And the plenary at the very end of the session, my, one of my takeaways was uh, the gentleman stood up and he said, we're, we're collecting our use cases and it should not come as a surprise that 60% of our DOD use cases are build me a chat bot. So the industry is wanting to do this. We're wanting to look at using generative AI. So um, it's definitely something that's front and center. So for, for a discussion that happened in the previous session and one that's been talked and brought up here is clarifying some things about automation, autonomy, and AI. So AI is but one way to get to that panacea of autonomy, and so we're we're looking at AI as an enabling technology. It's just one way to get there. So not all uses of AI are fully autonomous. And as we put in the strategic plan, and I'll talk about on the next slide, we're looking at this from a graded approach. There's going to be use cases where AI is really a tool. It's an enabling tool for a design engineer or an operator to get information and then make a more informed decision. So we're looking at a spectrum from early use cases where it's an enabling tool for decision making all the way up to the area where one day it could be, uh, as Chris mentioned in his remarks, used for autonomous operation. 
And so there's multiple definitions that exist, but uh, I'm not here today to help define what AI is. We made a valiant attempt in our strategic plan to talk about what we uh, consider AI to be, and I will tell you that took a lot of back and forth and going round and round. So there's a lot of definitions of AI. What I want to discriminate here on is automation and autonomy, clarifying that automation is based on prescriptive and predefined rules. Autonomy allows for the system to respond to situations that were not pre-programmed or anticipated. And so we're looking at this, like I said, as a spectrum of integration with human decision makers. And so the last session, if you were able to attend that, talked a little, little bit about uh, how AI might come up in remote operations. And as you're aware, there is going to be a graded approach of human involvement in AI integration. And so this table here is taken directly out of our AI strategic plan. And the original intent was to start the conversation on where does your use case fall in this spectrum. So these categories are not that different from New Rego 700 on the levels of automation. And Chris had a similar thing in his slide earlier that you saw. So we just wanted to ha start the conversation about what that would look like from where you fall in your use case. Is it insight or fully autonomous? And from our public works, our data science and regulatory AI regulatory applications public workshops that we've had starting in 2021, I can fairly confidently say that most use cases fall in the level one category, maybe the level two. So where are we going with all of this? The end goal, you'll see the purple line on the slide, that basically says where we're at today. That's, we're March 2024. We put out the project plan this year in September, September 2023. And the goal down here is to start looking in FY 2025 at developing a framework for AI-enabled autonomous operations. And so part of that is being fed in by a regulatory gap analysis that we're currently doing, and then a technical evaluation framework in these tasks. So all of this is leading towards that end where we would potentially be considering what the future looks like if you were to have an AI-enabled autonomous reactor system, or, and I should caveat this, not just reactors could be fuel cycle facilities. It could be anything under the NRC's umbrella of things that we regulate. So moving forward, we must remain vigilant and we keep, we're trying to keep tabs on this technology. As I mentioned, two years ago, ChatGPT wasn't a thing and that totally had to, you know, changed our way of looking at this and we had to pivot. So the NRC has been proactively looking at this technology and trying to address the gaps that may exist in our regulation or guidance. And that's part of why we uh, started doing the regulatory gap analysis, which will be a topic of discussion at our next public meeting in September of this year. So we're working on training programs for staff so that we can upskill <laughs> all the very smart people that we have at the agency so that we can prepare them for those that are uh, interested in the topic can participate in the technical discussions on evaluating the technology. And then lastly, we continue to encourage stakeholders to reach out to us. Our public workshops have been a great engagement tool, as is the RIC here. Um, every day we hear about some new use case, so I continue to encourage uh, our stakeholders to reach out to us and let us know what is going on in this area. So with that, I conclude my remarks, and I think we transition over back to Vic and Q&A. Thanks. Thank you. All right, thanks, Matt. And I think we're gonna do questions and answers now. So um, if um, I can ask the AV folks to bring up the QR code again for folks to ask questions. And we do have some questions coming in, so we'll spend about, uh, looks like 25 minutes or so doing questions. All right, let's start, here we go. Let's start with question one. This is gonna be for Darren, Albert, and Chris. How do you prepare for unforeseen circumstances? How effective is AI in scenarios it is not trained for? So Darren, maybe I can ask you to go first and then we'll go to Albert and then Chris, we'll have you come on. Sure, and as uh, Matt mentioned, uh, responding to 
uh, situations that weren't explicitly trained for it, generalizing, uh, if you will, that's really one of the main strengths of uh, AI and machine learning systems. So uh, it's, it's, you know, it, it's a capability that, uh, that we rely on. The, the key is determining in those circumstances what is it supposed to do? What is it generalizing to or from? What's the, what's the correct behavior and can you bound that? So uh, depending on the application, again, remember no one size fits all, there are different ways to do that. Uh, part of one critical thing for us is to define what's called the <laughs> operational design domain. You know, what is the region of input space over which this system is supposed to operate? And have you sufficiently covered that space, either through testing to show that your, your data sets are complete and representative uh, relative to that ODD, or through analysis, do you have tools that allow you to completely assess what the behavior of the system can be? Again, you, know, for, you can do that kind of thing for smaller systems. Uh, we reach scalability limits for larger uh, vision and perception-based systems where it's uh, actually very difficult to define exactly what it means to, uh, to, to, you know, for a data set to be complete relative to the scenarios that you expect to, uh, to encounter. So uh, it, it's, uh, it, it's not a solved problem um, by any means, um, but there are, there are certain use cases which actually are operationally of interest to us where you can, um, where you can put precise bounds on what the system will do even under these unanticipated, you know, what are supposed to be unanticipated systems or un un uh, you know, untrained uh, inputs. Yeah, thanks for, for highlighting that. And, and I want to dive a little bit deeper in the example I gave on, on uh, how we actually deployed the AI control model. And I think I mentioned in my presentation that actually if you look at, for example, advanced process control, you have to do step changes in the process. So there's actually things you can do with an AI control model and learning on a simulator where you can actually make the model more robust than what you're capable of creating today. Mm -hmm. So I think the AI is actually allowing us to create a, a way more a robust uh, model in, instead of making it more unforeseen, if you will. And that was also why after those 35 days, the Japanese customer wanted to go through wintertime, summertime, to look at the impacts to the facility. Um, would the maintenance stop actually disrupt the AI control model or was the AI control model immediately able again to pick up the control? And the answer was yes, the AI control model was trained that well on the historical data and, and in the training data sets that it was actually able to deal with a, a lot more unforeseen circumstances than, than regular control would allow you to do. Um, so I think that that's... So you can even include accident situations and unsafe situations that you wouldn't be able to exactly, do on, exactly. real, on yeah. real systems. Yeah. Yeah, and for myself, I would say that having clear um, kind of limits of authority of what the AI can actually do and having those actually defined and recognizable by the operator. You know, I know when a parameter is out of spec such that, you know, the uh, the AI needs to trip off. Uh, and I think defining that, you know, at the very onset uh, with the understanding that the operator essentially will become the, 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 the verifier and the decision maker of the initial aspects of the AI. Uh, and then uh, if for any reason that we would consider that the AI is, is outside of those parameters, then obviously the training for the operator to be able to safe state it. Great, thank you, Chris. All right, uh, next question is gonna go to Matt. So Matt, how can AI explain its decision to the operator? I think it's the black box concept. Do you need a separate AI explanation for the AI's operation, I guess, from the regulatory perspective? Short answer, yes. <laughs> so that, that's one of the, the tripping points right now, right, is, is explainability. And I was thinking about this in, in, lieu, in, in light of the comments of the, the panel here today, that industries of what we've heard can be as skeptical of this technology as we are maybe as a regulator. So the person on the, the end user of using the technology can actually be quite skeptical about the feedback that it's getting. I don't know about if anyone remembers the first time they ever drove an autonomous operated vehicle or maybe one that at least had emergency braking. I was quite skeptical of the first time thinking, is it actually gonna stop? 
is my car going to slow down when I approach the vehicle ahead of me? So until there's a level of trust that's built up or a method to explain to the user, uh, not just the regulator, the user in a, in a very transparent way about why the system is making the decision that it's doing, this is no different than a traditional control logic system. If you can't interpret it and make a decision and trust that it's doing what it's doing, then that is a, that's a hard sell to get someone adjusted to that. And I think about even some of the systems that have been demoed to me, my first question was, well, why did it do that? Why, why are the uncertainty bands this big? What if I pick a different model? So those are all the questions that come up um, that I think are quite important in developing up front a user interface, the model, and all of that that goes into it to explain, make the AI system explainable to the end user and the reviewer. So, yeah, I would like to build to that, and, and uh, I want to emphasize the importance of the humans factors engineering and, and the whole change management process, right? And we have done that for the last 20 years with, with going from PID control to advanced process control. And, and, and customers that already went through that process, they have a lot of learnings on how to bring the operator along in that process and, and, and under, explain what, what the APC is doing. And, and I think those are in the advantage because they will already be used to that process and will be much more tempted to accept the AI control model in, in that sense. People who are going from Primatic or PID control uh, immediately to AI, I think that there will be a big culture shock and you really have to think how you set up your program to involve all the people uh, in, at site and, and make them part of that process to gain that, that trust and, and confidence in, in the AI control model. I want to push back on that just a little bit because, um, <laughs> yeah, start a fight. Um, uh, and, and I think you said this, this, Matt, there's aspects of this where explainability doesn't have to be something, some new uh, uh, AI specific problem. It's true for any system that we design that it may or may not require explainability. The operator, the pilot may or may not need to know or anticipate what the system is going to do. Many of the things that we're working on now, the pilot has no interest whatsoever how the, you know, the altimeter came up with the number that it's going to display or the recommended most efficient altitude that it should fly at or whatever the function is. They just expect to, to be given that information and the explainability is kind of baked into the, the requirements for the, for the system. So, and, and that includes the human factors uh, aspects of it. So there, you know, there's probably some applications where we have to deal with that specifically, but a lot of times for, in my experience, it's just part of the requirements for the system. So, so I, I want to help out Matt a little bit here. <laughs> um, if you look at the generative AI side, uh, I, I think, and, and ChatGPT was, was referenced, natural learn, learning processing uh, methodologies, that's actually where you get a lot of that black box feeling, and, yeah. and, and, and that's where validation and verification become more important. Yeah, I agree. I'm not putting that on an airplane, though. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hope that makes you happy. <laughs> Chris, I don't want you to feel left out of the explainability uh, <laughs> argument here. <laughs> well, I, I was just thinking, you know, operators uh, have always made really good careers at breaking great design. So, so I think it's really important to be able to bring the operations kind of team early in the development of the AI. Because I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna defend uh, my boy Matt there in the sense that you, you, you have to build trust with the operations because operators will tend to overthink situations. It's only when they can piece the elements of information together that they can have the confidence that the machine is working correctly, that they'll actually follow what the machine is doing. Otherwise, they're, you know, they're gonna get skitterish and, and try to safe state it. And, and that's, I think, when you start to get the, the rub points in that. Awesome, all right, thanks for the discussion, guys. That was good, yeah, keep it, keep it going. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> um, all right, Darren, a question for you. Um, what from the aviation domain is most amenable uh, for adoption by nuclear? I know you have, uh, I, think, I think you said when we were chatting earlier, nuclear is your hobby. Um, yeah. Paddle ball is maybe from my eyes. <laughs> you have an interesting hobby, but uh, curious your thoughts on that crossover between aviation um, and nuclear. Um, yeah, uh, so there, I, th I mean, clearly a lot of things that we're working on probably don't have direct um, 
uh, analogies like these, uh, the perception-based systems where we, we, you know, we're, we're, we need to automate, you know, a pilot looking out the window or something like that. Um, one, uh, one that comes to mind uh, is uh, we're, we're working on systems now to detect pilot fatigue, especially as you start thinking about, you know, maybe having fewer pilots in the, uh, in the cockpit. If you only have one pilot, you want them to be uh, awake and alert. And I, uh, I think that this is a concern for uh, nuclear operators uh, as well. And so um, some of the really, you know, uh, Useful technology for that is uh, uh, camera-based systems, and that you know monitor mouth and eyelid position and blink rates, and uh, are able to correlate that with a, uh, a fatigue level. So we're we're bringing this technology into our world, uh, oddly enough, from the automotive world, where it's uh, fairly well advanced, and we're looking at what has already been done there that we could take credit for in some of these uh, automotive and trucking industry uh, fatigue detection systems that we will uh, harden and re-implement and recertify in, uh, in in our world. So that's that's uh, one good example, I think. Yeah. Thank you. All right, we'll take a little really different track, and this is directed, uh, Albert, to you, but I think this is going to touch everybody. Um, so is AI being used to provide cyber security? Um, so I think that, that if you look at cyber security, it is everywhere, right? The, the, the threats of, of uh, being hacked, um, um, have, have intruders in, in your software somewhere, uh, is, everything is connected. It becomes more and more important that the design of the products is in, in compliance with the standards. Uh, the IEC 60443 uh, specifically is, is very important in that aspect. Um, and, and I think I haven't seen too much of AI deployments on our side uh, with cybersecurity, but I think AI really adds value in being able to detect uh, intrusions, uh, all these type of things. Uh, just from my personal experience, I haven't seen a lot of AI. And, and, and similarly, actually, on, on the safety side of things, uh, I think AI can help us so much out with the validation process, and, and if you look at that current process with the thick manuals we have with, with, with data on mean time to repair, mean time between failure that are all essential to do your, your uh, safety loop calculations. I think, think with sitting on that tremendous amount of data, AI can make our life so much easier there. Um, so I see it as a possibility to, to make our lives easier and, and protect us to whatever is out there. Um, but I myself am not that familiar with implementations to date uh, specifically on cybersecurity. I'll, I'll add one comment that um, it's actually, that's definitely, and it, it's clearly stated in our strategic plan, the look at safety and security uses of AI technology. And so our Office of Research actually has uh, at least one, if not more, research projects on this very topic of looking at using AI ML uh, to detect cybersecurity intrusion. So it is something, and, and I know our other office, uh, INSER, is very keenly concerned with this exact topic with cybersecurity, both for using it as a tool to detect intrusions and also as it is a new vector for considering attacks. And so we are definitely, those are two topics that are definitely front and center. Uh, I think my, our presentation tends to skew towards the operating reactor fleet, but as I said at the end of my remarks, that is not it. That, that's not the end story. We have materials facilities, we have cybersecurity, uh, physical security, we have, and, and the operating fleet. So it's, it's just not, it's not just power reactors that we're thinking about when we look at the umbrella of our strate AI strategic plan. Chris and Darren, I don't know if you guys want to jump in on cybersecurity, any any thoughts or experience or what you've what you've seen. Uh, well, aside from it, it has to be the centerpiece. It is the 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 question we have to be able to answer, especially when we move into, into autonomy and we start to move towards more safety controlled systems. Uh, and I think that sort of the collaboration of the industry to, to make that the principal focus is, is the highest one. 
Yeah, and I'm, I'm not involved in the, this kind of research, but in our, our, our research organization, we definitely have people that are looking at, you know, evaluating data patterns to detect the attacks. Um, uh, DARPA did a program a few years ago, the Cyber Grand Challenge, where they had, you know, robots attacking robots and defending against the other robots. And so that was kind of an a interesting interaction on both, way, both sides of uh, using um, uh, uh, ad advanced techniques from AI to both create attacks and defend against um, attacks. But um, also the, the, the new um, uh, threat vectors is uh, very much uh, uh, on our radar as well. Yeah, yeah maybe to add, uh, coming from the chemical industry, and I think if you look at some of the majors, they actually spend a lot of attention on cybersecurity and making sure all the layers of protection are in place. Um, I also deal with a lot of the smaller type or medium-sized companies, and, and often they even say, no, no, our operational system is air-gapped, right? It's not connected to the... That's not true. <laughs> so, so there's a lot of misconception about cybersecurity, and not all sites are as cybersecurely safe as they believe they are currently today, right? So that also comes back to education, cross-industry collaboration, uh, I think it's it's finding each other in this type of conferences and, and share experiences with each other to make sure that we're doing the right things. I appreciate that, guys. So we have a lot of questions. You guys really did your job in getting us questions. Thank you. We have too many questions. So I'm going to do a choose your story. We have questions about hallucinations and questions about bias. So again, we have a wealth of experience here. Maybe you can each share um, a story of what you may have experienced for a hallucination in an AI system or where bias has, has thrown a monkey wrench into what you've done. Um, Chris, you're, uh, you're, you're thinking, so we'll, we'll come back to you, Chris. Um, Darren, do you want to go first? Can I put you on the spot? Um, sure. The, uh, the, um, the term hallucinations uh, refers to um, generative AI or large language models like ChatGPT. Um, uh, you know, will often give you a response with high confidence that turns out to be wrong. And um, so the, 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 you know, and sometimes this, you know, it can be related to just mathematical facts that it wasn't able to memorize, things that actually required, you know, deductive uh, reasoning. But what that points to is we really, if to use that kind of generative AI technology in safety critical or safety adjacent uh, applications, that means we have to have some way of detecting these hallucinations or uh, basically just wrong, wrong answers. So the ideal architecture is one where you use the generative AI to give you lots of really interesting, creative, uh, uh, potential solutions exploring a design space, but you still have some way to, to verify whether those solutions are correct and meet your requirements. And so we have a, a, a lot of applications uh, internally for doing design, design exploration, even developing uh, mathematical proofs uh, that we can independently check where generative AI is, is really great at coming up with these solutions. But the key is having some independent way to check, validate um, uh, the, the, the accuracy of those, uh, those candidate solutions. Over. Yeah, please. Yeah, so uh, I think the hallucination is, is exactly coming from the generative AI side, so no, no discussion or debate here. I, I'm in agreement with you. Um, it, it's sometimes just scary if you get the wrong suggestions, right? And you would be taking the wrong actions as, as a consequence. Um, for me, what, what on the positive side of generative AI, I've, I've seen the possibilities to create your own uh, protected environment where you can upload all of your technical document, instruction manuals, general specification sheets. Uh, it's like an improved search engine. Search engines can find stuff and, and, and uh, now strengthened with AI, you can actually start asking questions. And, and uh, sometimes I get questions from my customers that say, hey, why do you have four power supplies in this junction box? I don't, I don't know. Right, so, so it takes me an hour to find that answer somewhere hidden in an instruction manual. So actually we have now seen that, that by uploading all those documents into the database and training the AI model, that you now can actually not only get that answer, uh, but it also points you to in which document it found it and, and which resource was actually giving you that answer and how trustworthy that resource is. 
So I think these, these are tremendous benefits that we can see on the generative AI side specifically. Yeah. Thanks, Albert. Chris, yeah, I, I, yeah, go for it, please, Chris. Yeah, I, I definitely see generative AI never in actually control space. Uh, I just don't, you know, I, I can see machine learning and I can see how it can kind of refine itself. But I think because of the risk of having essentially the machine have hallucination, try to be able to create, you know, essentially a, a, a run that says, this is the answer, but it being wrong. I don't think that's a risk we can ever really accept. And I think within control, it has to be much, much, much more refined, much better understood than just allowing, as I said, the AI to run rampant and, and make a decision for us. Thanks, Chris. So we're getting short on time. Matt, I'm gonna throw one more question at you because I think I know the answer. I think it's a pretty quick answer. Um, but I love the way the question was written. So I'm gonna give a, a credit to Tequia for, for asking this question. I love this. So people who possess expertise in both nuclear engineering and information technology are likely to be highly valued in the market. I could not agree more, Matt. You gotta stay with us. Don't, don't leave us. Uh, securing such rare talents within the government often results in a significant discrepancy in compensation compared to their market value. What strategies could be considered by the government to secure such talents? How do we keep our talented? How do we recruit the good folks? Remote work. I'll put in a plug for remote work. I'm, but I, joking aside, I, I put that out as a, as I throw that out because there was recently a posting by the Department of Homeland Security for 50 positions that I, I, I was shared with because I'm part of the GSA AI community of practice. And, and that was one of their selling points was remote work, high paid position, uh, big breadth of high security, uh, you know, job opportunity. But, but going back to the question was, I do really think that our industry as a whole, and I've, I've sort of informally polled people as we talk about it, uh, but there's, we have a lot of smart people. And so training someone from the ground up maybe is not the best solution. And so one tack that I see a lot of people taking is upskilling their existing staff uh, because this is an area where people are interested both in their personal lives and professional lives. And so I, I've noticed a lot of industry utilities, we're doing the same thing, other industries, the DOD, uh, all over the place, basically putting training programs in place such that they can, you can take someone who knows a lot about math, science, engineering, statistics, law, all sorts of stuff, and focus them on this area where they can upskill into this position, in, into these positions, and then you know the retaining them part. That that's the harder yeah. question. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but uh, but money. You've made, you've made them very attractive. They've, they're to poachers. It is as uh, as as uh, Vic said at the outset of the situation. Prompt engineering, a job now, right? Like that didn't exist two years ago. A prompt engineer. Mm -hmm. So, so I guess my point is that. Uh, the Googles, Metas, and all that will always have money to throw at highly educated people. Uh, the rest of us have to be a little bit more mission-oriented uh, with some nice niceties there to really go for, uh, you know, keeping us around, I guess. Go for it, yeah. Yeah, uh, just to build on that, and I fully agree, actually. So, so we just completed uh, uh, some of the engagement survey within our organization, and the things that stood out were uh, autonomy, and not autonomous operation, but <laughs> autonomy for people, right? Being able to make decisions, work-life balance, and career development and training. So I believe if you take care of your people in a proper way, um, then, then remuneration might actually become even less of an issue, right? No, I'm, I'm serious. I'm, well, I don't know. I like money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see what I got here. I got this one. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we've, we've definitely, uh, in our industry, we've definitely lost people to the, 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 the Googles and the Amazons of the, uh, of, of the world. But, um, you know, what would you rather do, build airplanes or build web servers? I mean, or, well. You know, if you get stressed and burned out, you might want to reconsider. Yeah, exactly. Money, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> All right. So yeah, take. Uh, uh, I also think another aspect of it is actually kind of be able to entice new people into the particular industry. I mean, for 20 plus years, my office was a stale green control room with no windows and very old dials and a pen and paper. Um, you know, I've never been more engaged in my life than I have been in the last few years of really kind of embracing new technology. And I think the nuclear industry has been slow to adopt that. Like we're very conservative, you know, we, we like to do the safe and, and sure thing. But I think actually, and as we should, 
But I think getting people excited about what we're trying to do, whether it's autonomous operation, whether it's about AI, or whether it's like a new nuclear technology, I think there's just not enough of us in the industry to be able to meet the demand that is happening now to scale up. And I think the only way to be able to do that is really start getting other people into it. And I think that's done through technology and, and, and just the excitement behind it. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Chris. And thanks all. So I do want to bring us back to um, what I opened with on the podcast, because I, uh, this podcast it was a great podcast talked about the industry moving so fast and AI that there really are no new AI experts out there because it's just moving too fast. And when I first heard that, I said, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. But as we put this session together and I've heard you all speak, I said, that's, that's wrong. And, and the fact that you, you've brought your expertise and that we have this level of expertise on the panel uh, warms my heart to know we have incredible folks working on this, collaborating, talking. So really a heartfelt thank you for joining us today. Thank you for joining us here at the RIC. Thank you for, in the crowd for, for making this one of the best attended sessions of the day and of the entire RIC. And with that, I'll say thank you. Let's rock and roll. Let's go, uh, let's go have some fun. Thank you. Thank you.